The reading this morning is taken from Micah chapter 2, and you will find that on page 931 in the Pew Bibles. Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light they carry it out because it is in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. Therefore the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity. In that day, people will ridicule you. They will taunt you with this mournful song. We are utterly ruined. My people's possession is divided up. He takes it from me. He assigns our fields to traitors. Therefore, you will have no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by lot. Do not prophesy, their prophets say. Do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. You descendants of Jacob, should it be said, does the Lord become impatient? Does he do such things? Do not my words do good to the one whose ways are upright? Lately my people have risen up like an enemy. You strip off the rich robe from those who pass by without a care, like men returning from battle. You drive the women of my people from their pleasant homes. You take away my blessing from their children forever. Get up, go away, for this is not your resting place, because it is defiled. It is ruined beyond all remedy. If a liar and deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, that would be just the profit for this people. I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a sheepfold, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. The one who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out. Their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Margaret. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask now as we spread your word out before us that you would open our ears, uh, indeed the ears of our hearts, that we might find you speaking to us in the very depths of our being by the power of your Holy Spirit to bring glory to Jesus in our lives. Amen. Amen. Great. Well, good morning. If you were here last week, we uh, began listening to this prophecy from the prophet uh, Micah, perhaps a slightly more unfamiliar part of the Bible for many of us. And you don't have to read far in the prophets to see that they are the kind of people who do not pull their punches. Okay? They're the kind of people who will tell you the way it is. Okay? They, do, they don't mince their words. Okay? If there's bad news, they will tell you bad news. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Feels like a bad thing when someone is sort of getting up in our face. But I think we know that if it's for a good reason, we know that that is a, a good thing for us. I once had a conversation with someone who had gone to have a medical test and they went for the test, and, and then they never heard anything back. And they thought, oh, phew, what a relief. That's a good thing, right? Except that it turned out that the test result had got lost. And when it finally resurfaced, it, it showed that there actually was something pretty seriously wrong with that person. They, they did need medical treatment, and it should have started months ago. Now, that person was pretty upset about that situation and in their upsetness do you, get, do you get what they were saying they were saying that it would have been a good thing to have got that bad news okay our instinct our first instinct is to avoid the bad news but we know actually that we need it you know i need to know 
that my car has failed its MOT. If the wheel drops off while I'm doing 70 miles per hour on the A38, what am I going to think? I'm going to think, oh, it would have been really good if they told me the nuts needed tightening up. Okay. Now, in Micah chapter 2, Micah has bad news about bad fruit for bad listeners. Okay. But at least the sun is shining this morning okay, to cheer us up alongside it. And as we read it, I really want you to remember that principle, that it is a good thing to get bad news. But hang in there, because when we get to the end, we're going to see that Micah also has a surprise for us. So here we go. The bad news. Let, let's have it. it. It's in verse 3. Have a look at verse 3. We're on page 931. And verse 3 says, Therefore the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity. Now, what's he talking about just there? He's talking about the great tragedy that happened at the end of the Old Testament. He calls it a disaster. He calls it a calamity. He also mentioned it at the end of chapter 1, which we were looking at last week, uh, which he sort of spells it out there. He says, uh, there's an exile coming, okay? Uh, by which he means you're going to be uh, invaded by a foreign power. They will take you captive and deport you to a different land where you will serve them as slaves. Now, that hasn't happened yet. That happens at the end of uh, the Old Testament, but it's coming. And when it comes, you'll find yourself saying things like, he gives some examples in verse 4, our land has been divided up. It's been taken away from us. And now our enemies own it. They live in it. Okay. That's the bad news. Dragged off to live in a foreign land as slaves. So reading the Old Testament, and we were saying this last week, uh, is rather like watching a disaster movie in that the storyline doesn't end well. You, you know when you watch uh, Titanic or Twister or going further back, the Poseidon adventure, you're not really wondering, how's this story going to end? Because you know it doesn't end well. It ends in disaster and calamity. The fascination with stories like that is in how the disaster plays out, you know, why it happens, what, what has gone wrong to cause these events to take place. Now, that's the thing to ponder when it comes to the disaster story that is the Old Testament. Why did it happen? Why did it end like this? And there are layers of answers to that, to that question. You know, why, why did it end in, in such a mess in the Old Testament? There are layers of answers to that question. And the answer given in verse 3 of our passage is easy to miss, but hugely important. Verse 3 says, Therefore the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people. So why, why did the Old Testament end in disaster? The exile happened? Because the Lord planned it. In other words, the exile, this coming disaster, from Micah's perspective, a coming disaster, wasn't just a, another case of what you might call international thuggery. Okay? Um, you know, a more powerful nation comes along. In this case, it's going to be Babylon and beats up a less powerful nation, in this case, Israel. Okay. And the history of the world is littered with that kind of thing, isn't it? A more powerful nation beats up or invades a less powerful nation. Still is. Still in the news today, that kind of thing. In a way, though, if it had just been a case of that kind of thing in the Old Testament, that would have been easier to come to terms with. But verse 3 tells us that the exile happened not just or even primarily because Israel was outgunned by a bigger country, it happened because the Lord planned it. In other words, the bad news of Micah chapter 2 is not just that a bad nation is going to do bad things to them. The bad news of Micah chapter 2 is that God was behind it. The God who freed them is now going to enslave them again. The God who gave them the land is now going to take it away from them. The bad news is that the good God has become their worst enemy. 
which is how the New Testament puts the bad news as well, isn't it? Do you remember, perhaps you recall how the Apostle Paul puts it at the beginning of Romans, the wrath of God has been revealed against the ungodlessness and sin of mankind. God, Paul even uses the word in Romans, God has become our enemy. Now, why? Why, why, why does the Bible say such a devastating thing? The answer is, second thing, bad fruit, okay? Look at verses 1 and 2. Micah has bad news about bad fruit. Look, look at verse 1. He says, woe to those who plan iniquity. And that word woe, when you see that word woe in the Bible, Jesus uses it as well in the Gospels. Woe, that word woe means I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. It also means, and I don't want you to be in your shoes. That's why the prophet, that's why Jesus says, says these things. Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light, they carry it out because it's in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. So what Mike is describing is, is you know, it sounds like the culture of Israelite society had become deeply corrupt and uncaring. And I said last week, maybe the key verse of the book of Micah is Micah chapter 6, verse uh, 7, verse 8, which, which says, what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And here in chapter 2 is a prime example of what Micah uh, means. Israelites were supposed to be like their God, okay? God is a person who loves people and has a heart for the weak, the poor, the vulnerable. And his people are supposed to be reflective of that. You know, we are supposed to be people who love people. We have a heart for the weaker, the poorer, the more vulnerable members of our community and our wider society. And yet in Micah's day, as in our own, the gap between the rich and the poor was getting bigger and bigger as land and property was being grabbed by the rich and the powerful, forcing the poorer and weaker members of society deeper into poverty. Verse 9, when you get down to verse 9, talks about the women and children of the day. The most vulnerable were being abused. That's the bad fruit that Micah is putting the spotlight on for us. And I've called it fruit. I've called it fruit for a reason, because fruit has a root, okay? And in this passage, I, I, I think there are two roots that Micah points us to that this bad fruit springs from, grows out of, okay? The first root of this bad fruit comes at the beginning of verse two. Have a look at verse two. Those two words there where he simply says, they covet. Now, what is coveting? We've got um, an album of Bible songs for children that we listen to from time to time in the car. And one of the songs is uh, intended to teach the Ten Commandments and get, you know, get the Ten Commandments in, in your head. And the last of the Ten Commandments, you may know, is the command, do not covet. Okay? And whenever the song gets to that commandment in the words of the song, because you know, the song goes round and round a few times, but whenever the song comes to that do not covet line, a little voice pipes up in the background of the song saying, what is covet? What is covet? I want to know so I can avoid it. What is it? Okay. Cover is a wanting word, isn't it? And it's very telling in that song that they feel the need, albeit humorously in the song, to highlight the fact that it's a word that we're less familiar with these days. What is covet? I want to know. We're less familiar with that, that word. And you, you know how, it's a bit like this, you know how um, they say Eskimos have multiple different words for snow? You know, snow is such a big part of their lives. So, you know, they're so familiar with it that they can spot different kinds of uh, snow. We're much less familiar with snow, so we just have one word. You know, it's white, it's cold, it's frozen, it's snow. Okay, that's as, that's as sophisticated as we get with with snow, we're much less familiar with it. But the Eskimos are so familiar that they're able to recognize, distinguish different kinds of it so they have different words and vocabulary for it. Same with words for wanting. 
Covet is a wanting word. And the ancient Hebrews were much more familiar with the ins and outs of the human heart than maybe we are. And they had words for it. Today, we just want stuff, okay? We're less likely to use a word like covet. We're not so familiar with the distinctions, the different longings of our own hearts that can be described in different ways. There are different kinds of wantings, and covet or coveting identifies one of those wantings of the human heart, a, in this case, a bad kind of wanting. So covetousness is when you want something so much that you lose your contentment in God. Particularly when you look at someone else's life and you think, look at their life. I want what they've got. I want their life. And it makes you forget to count your own blessings, blessings that God has brought into your life. And you lose your contentment in God. Covetousness is that kind of wanting. So covet is a heart word. And therefore, Micah is reminding us that God, you know, before anything becomes external, fruit, bad fruit, Micah's pointing out that the root of those external bad fruit things is in our hearts. Verse 1, look at verse 1. He says in verse 1, those who, talks about those who plan iniquity, who plot evil on their beds. Now, I don't think we should picture someone, can you picture someone lying on their bed, you know, snuggled into their duvet, plotting evil? What's the What's the picture that comes into your mind? You know, someone rubbing their hands like this, going, as they plan their evil deeds for, for the day. That's not the, the, that's not the point. The point is that when they do get out of bed and do the unjust things that Micah is critical of, his point is they did, that stuff, that bad fruit, didn't just come from nowhere. That bad fruit has been festering in their hearts all along. Even when they're asleep in their beds, there's, there's a, a root to that fruit, which is, I think, the thing that nails all of us in this passage. Because I might read verses 1 and 2, and I, and I feel like, you know, to be honest, it feels a million miles away from where I am. I have never seized anyone's house or field. Not guilty, Your Honor. Okay. But if the root is there, one way or another, there will be some kind of bad fruit in my life. The fruit might just be an indifference to the plight of the poor. Because, you know, what you want, what I want, the desires of my heart, my discontentment, are kind of blinding me to the needs of other people. Which is why Jesus, you know, also wasn't content with sort of a superficial obedience. Remember his words in the Sermon on the Mount? You, you know, you remember what he said? He said, you've heard that it was said, Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit murder. And we're listening to Jesus and we're going, oh, that's okay then because I haven't committed murder. But Jesus then goes on and he says, I say to anyone who is angry, oh, whoa, 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 Jesus, you're taking it back to the heart again. Anyone who is angry will also be subject to judgment. You see Jesus taking it to the root that the fruit springs from. In other words, what goes on in the heart is tremendously significant. Micah says so, Jesus says so, root, fruit. And I said there was two roots to the bad fruit in this chapter. The other root actually comes, springs out of, or is, is in last week's passage in chapter one. Because do you remember Micah's big point last week? Do you remember if you were here, we were saying, we were sort of observing that Micah was saying the people of Israel had lost their first love. So they lost their love for the God who had loved them, the God who'd saved them and blessed them abundantly. They lost their love for him. They'd fallen in love with, with other gods. Idolatry, he calls it. Now, I mentioned the Ten Commandments a moment ago, but that, that is the first of the Ten Commandments, isn't it? You shall have no other gods before me, commandment number one. In other words, commandment number one, do not fall out of love with the God who has loved you. And then you have all the other commands, you know, about the Sabbath, adultery, murder, and so on, down to the Tenth Commandment, which is do not covet. You sort of wonder, I wonder if there's a link between losing your first love, being filled up with God's goodness to you. Is there a link between that 
and that last command of coveting? I think there is. When I fall out of love with the God who has loved me so much, what follows in my life? What fruit will come from that? Well, all sorts of things, but it's striking that the first and last commandments are both about what our hearts do or shouldn't love. Okay? If your heart is full of love for God, command number one, because you're aware of his massive goodness and kindness to, do, to you, then your heart will be a contented heart. Okay? But if we lose that first love, if we, if we lose the love that sight of the love God has for, for us, if we're no longer conscious of the goodness of God to us, if he doesn't fill our vision and our heart as he should, then there will be room for weeds to grow in our hearts, discontentment, longings and wantings that shouldn't be there. See, there's a link, two roots. Uh, the bad fruit comes from coveting. Coveting itself comes from losing your first love your contentment in the God who has loved you so much. I remember seeing a cartoon once, and it was a cartoon about uh, Moses. Uh, he's just been up to meet God to receive the commandments, and he's coming down. The cartoon pictured Moses, big beard, two stone tablets under his arm, coming down from Mount Sinai, just met God, and he says to the people waiting for him at the bottom, he says, I've got good news, and I've got bad news. Good news. I've got it down to 10. Bad news, adultery's still in. Okay. Now we get the joke, okay? Although it doesn't sound like you lot found it very funny, but do you see the assumption behind the joke that God is out to spoil our fun? God is not good. Life would be better if God buttered out. If we minimize the number of commands he, he might have given us. But Micah is saying to his generation and to our generation, he's saying, is life really better if you forsake God and his commands? Root, fruit, you know, the root losing our first love for God, the fruit of that is discontented coveting, which in turn bears fruit in selfish lack of concern for others and a culture in which, for example, child poverty is tolerated that's not great, is it? That's not good. By the way, it was, it was lovely on Friday afternoon. I, I was invited to the official little launch of the hygiene hub that we've been mentioning over the, in recent months. And it was great to see that up and running. And you know, lovely to see in part our church in partnership with others. Thank you for contributing to that if you did that, perhaps praying for it. I know a number of us have volunteered to help get that uh, up, up and running. There is a heart, I know there's a heart, for the more vulnerable, the, the people who are weaker and, and, so, and so on. But it springs from that love for God himself who has loved us. The, the reason God requires us to act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with our God is because he's a good God. And when the good God is at the center of our lives, there is good fruit. Now, how did this, all of this, land with Micah's hearers? answer is not very well. Look at verse 6. Okay, we'll pick up speed now. Verse 6 says, uh, says, do not prophesy. And Micah is quoting the other prophets of his day just there. Do not prophesy, their prophets say to Micah. Do not prophesy about these things, Micah. Disgrace will not overtake us. In other words, they're saying, Micah, stop being grumpy. Okay, stop it with all the bad news stuff, Micah. Cheer us up. Don't beat us down. We don't want you to tell us all this bad news stuff. And I guess that's always the temptation for church leaders and, and churches. We don't want to be bearers of bad news. I think that was probably the temptation that the Archbishop of Canterbury faced this week when he was asked on one of Britain's most popular podcasts whether he stuck by the Bible's teaching on sex and marriage. And he caved. He told the interviewer what the interviewer wanted to hear, I think. Look how Micah puts that kind of thing, verse 11. Verse 11 says, If a liar and deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, that would be just the prophet for this people. It's, a, <laughs> it's quite a stinging, sarcastic way to put it, but he's saying, you're just telling people what they want to hear. Now, apart from the fact that it is astonishing that the Archbishop of Canterbury would go on record, 
to say he no longer believes what the Bible and the Church of England do believe. Apart from that, what was so sad was that he gave the impression that what the Bible teaches about such things, he gave the impression that, that it's not good news for us. But if we believe God is a good God, then what he lays out for our lives has got to be good news for us. Micah refuses to distort God's teaching and commands like that. So in verses 8, 9, and 10, he doubles down. He's not intimidated. He says, in effect, no, it's not bad news that God tells us the best way to live our lives. The bad news is that we're ignoring him, producing bad fruit in our lives. But, and here's where we're going to end, because this is where the chapter ends. Here is the surprise at the end of this uh, passage. In the Bible, the bad news is always, always the first part of the good news. So we've had 11 verses of bad news, really, about bad fruit for bad listeners from Micah. And then, boom, verse 12. God, out of the blue, God says, I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. That's the opposite of exile. I will gather you, not disperse you. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel, the opposite of judgment. I'll bring you to myself. Verse 13, the end of verse 13, Micah says, their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. It's a picture of people following God, not pulling away from him. It's a picture of restoration. When, I was reading it this week, when the great Bible commentator John Calvin wrote his comments on these verses, he, he couldn't believe it. Okay? It's so out of the blue, you know, 11 verses of bad news, and then suddenly there's this, good, there's this good news. It's so out of the blue that Calvin thought Micah must have been talking about God gathering his people to, to judge them. But that's not what it sounds like. That's not what most commentators think Micah means just here. Out of the blue, after all the bad news... God says, but I'm not giving up on you. Okay? It always works like that in the Bible. Think of how Jesus puts it. He says, the kingdom of God is here. Repent. Repent why? Because judgment is coming. Bad news. But bad news is always the beginning of the good news in the Bible. So how does Jesus go on? The kingdom of God is here. Repent. Bad news. And believe the good news. Or if you know the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul's book, book of Romans, read the first three chapters of the book of Romans. It's devastating. It's quite hard to get through. It's quite hard to stomach. So clear is he about the bad news in our lives. But push on to chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. You've got 13 chapters full of glorious good news because the bad news is always the beginning of the good news. Same with Micah just here. It feels like a bolt from the blue, but this is the way the good news of Jesus Christ works. He tells us the bad news to prepare us for good news. He tells us the bad news so that we know that we need good news. He tells us that we're sinners so that we know we need a savior. And if we just tell each other what we want to hear, we'll never get why. We need God and his salvation. So, if you've come to church this morning and you think, all I've heard is bad news, good. Good if that bad news makes you go, I want the good news. I need a savior, particularly perhaps in that area Mike has put his finger on of coveting, of discontentment with God. I know that's there in my heart, Lord. Lord, please forgive me. Please come to me. Please change me. Please heal me. Show me the bad fruit so that you can produce good fruit in my life. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. And the good news is God hasn't given up on us. Shall we pray together? So, Lord, we ask you this morning, as we listen to these words of Micah, I suppose there are lots of other passages in the Bible we would rather have flicked open this morning. But we thank you that when we...
give our ear to your word. We do hear you speaking to us about things we might not otherwise necessarily have thought about. Thank you for bringing them to our attention, Lord. And we pray what Micah says here, what you say here, would drive us ever more closely to put our faith and trust in you as the Savior who doesn't give up on sinners. In Jesus' name, amen.